It's a quick one. Last video hit over 100 comments, which is absolutely mind-blowing for this channel. Let's try that again for this video. Comment down what you think about these stories, or just a hello, and the team will reply. We always reply to the comments. As always, please like and subscribe and help this channel grow. Thank you. I still cringe when I think back to that it's disastrous first date with Sarah a few years ago. We had met on one of the popular dating apps and really hit it off chatting online over the past few weeks. She seemed funny, smart, and was super cute in her photos. When I finally got up the courage to ask her to meet up in person, she said yes right away. But then she mentioned she had signed up to be on some new dating show that was going to film our entire first date. The producers would be following us around with cameras all night to document it. I was skeptical at first since it sounded like an awkward experience. But I was so excited to actually meet Sarah that I looked past the cameras and gave her the awk. In hindsight, that was a naive mistake driven by wishful thinking about our online chemistry translating in person. The afternoon of the date, I probably spent over an hour getting ready, nervously picking out my best date outfit and overthinking every detail. Part of me wondered if the fancy clothes and colon were silly given the cameras, but I wanted to make a good impression on Sarah. I kept checking the time, eager to finally meet this girl, but also anxious about the filmy aspect. We had made plans to meet at 7 p.m. at a trendy cocktail bar in the East Village for drinks before dinner. As I approached the bar, I immediately spotted the small crew of producers and camera guys waiting out front. My heart was pounding as I walked up and introduced myself, confirming they were with the dating show. The wispy inside where I locked eyes with Sarah sitting alone at a table, and she gave a timid wave. My first thought was relief that she looked just as cute as her pictures. I went over, introduced myself in person, and sat down across from her. Despite chatting extensively online, we both seemed nervous and unsure how to act. Before we could get a word out, the film crew descended upon us with microphones asking generic questions about meeting on a dating app and our expectations for tonight. We stumbled through the awkward interview, then attempted to have a normal conversation once the crew backed off a bit. But there was zero natural chemistry in person. The filming made everything feel forced and strange. We struggled to find common interests, and the conversation was stilted. I kept trying to make dumb jokes or say interesting things to get some spark going, but Sarah did not seem amused or engaged at all. She gave lots of one-word answers and seemed totally disinterested in anything I said. This was not at all how our conversations had flowed for hours online. I started to wonder if she was just much shyer in person or if I had severely misjudged our chemistry based on our digital interactions. Either way, things were not going well and the prospect of spending the whole night together was becoming daunting. The producers even had to intervene and prompt us with questions or topics, but nothing seemed to get a real conversation going. After we painfully finished one drink each, the film crew announced it was time to head to the restaurant a few blocks away for dinner. That's when it suddenly dawned on me that I had made a massive mistake. In my excitement to finally meet Sarah, it hadn't even occurred to me that dinner after drinks would be expected. I naively thought we would just have a quick cocktail and call it a night. As a broke actor and waiter, I could barely afford a nice cocktail bar for our meetup, let alone a full dinner at some upscale restaurant. My mind raced trying to figure out how I could explain this to Sarah on camera without looking like a fool. This became even more apparent when we arrived at Slate, an expensive French bistro the producers had set up for the perfect ambiance and filming angles. They led us right to a table prominently placed in the middle of the dining room. I panicked knowing there was no way I could afford my share of dinner at a high-end place like this. I tried subtly mentioning I wasn't very hungry, and maybe we should just split some appetizers. But the producers pushed us to go all out and take advantage of this once-in-a-lifetime dining experience. When the waiter came over, I awkwardly asked for just one small appetizer while Sarah ordered a full three-course meal along with expensive wine pairings. She shot me a glare that I immediately understood as her realizing I clearly didn't have the money to be taking her somewhere this extravagant. I sheepishly sipped water while Sarah ate her way through the courses in icy silence. I tried making occasional small talk, but she was completely closed off and curt at that point. By the time dessert arrived, I was already dreading the inevitable bill. When it was delivered, the total was well over $300 just for her meal and wine alone. I awkwardly explained to Sarah and the cameras that I couldn't afford to pay and suggested she might want to cover her share. She shook her head in obvious disgust and begrudgingly threw down her credit card without a word. I felt like a complete idiot and the date couldn't end quickly enough after that uncomfortable exchange and realization. 
We suffered through a forced goodnight hug for the cameras before rushing off in opposite directions, both thoroughly disappointed with how it had gone. I tried to block the cringeworthy day out of my mind, but a few weeks later, Sarah texted that the episode we filmed was set to air soon. I didn't warn any friends about it coming, hoping no one I knew would even notice the show's existence. But right after it aired, my life took an even more mortifying turn. At the time, I was a junior analyst at a hedge fund, working hard to build a career in finance. The very next morning after the episode premiered, one of the senior executives at my firm requested that our whole team meet him first thing in the conference room. This seemed odd and I walked in puzzled but unaware. It turned out he had recorded my date show on his DVR and proceeded to play the entire episode on the huge screen for all my colleagues. I sank lower and lower into my seat watching my disastrous date broadcast across the room. The producers had edited the footage in the most unflattering way possible for me. They cut together my failed jokes without any context to make me seem completely bizarre and idiotic. I had connected with Georgia on a dating app, and we really hit it off chatting online. She was cute in her pictures, seemed sweet, and we had a lot in common based on our messages back and forth. When she suggested meeting up for our first date in person, I was excited to see if we had chemistry face to face. We made plans to go to dinner and a movie on New Year's night. In hindsight, that was probably not the best choice for a first date since it was a holiday, and most places would be closed early. But I was eager to meet Georgian and thought we could make it work. When New Year's finally arrived, I drove over to Georgina's house, flowers in hand, ready to pick her up. She opened the door with a big smile and welcomed me in. Right away, I noticed the overwhelming mishmash of decorations covering every surface inside. Georgian introduced me to her mom, who was way too enthusiastic about meeting me. She gushed about how happy she was that Georgina had met such a nice young man and insisted on taking our photo together right then and there. I tried to politely smile while feeling totally put on the spot. Georgina's family home was filled with the strangest combination of decor I've ever encountered. Her mother considered herself to be an artist and had created pieces out of old license plates, coins, farming tools, animal hides and skins, and all manner of random objects strewn about with no cohesive theme. It was chaotic visual overload. Before I could even process the unusual surroundings, Georgina's eager mother was ushering us upstairs to watch a video. Still not wanting to be rude, I went along with it, unsure of what to expect. The TV upstairs was draped in a zebra print rug, which perfectly represented the wild mishmash of decor in the house. There were two couches in the TV room. Georgina and I sat down on one while her grinning mother situated herself directly across from us on the other couch. I soon found out the video was a painfully awkward 20-minute school project Georgina had completed back in sixth grade. As we watched, Georgina snuggled up close and lifted my arm to put it around her shoulders. I was surprised by how forward she was being with her mom sitting right there, but I let my arm stay in place. Then Georgina's young teen brother, who I hadn't met yet, came over and sat down next to me. He promptly lifted my other arm and put it around him, imitating his sister. Neither seemed to think this was odd. Georgina's mom continued beaming at the three of us like it was a totally normal family bonding moment. I have never felt more uncomfortable. When the embarrassing video finally ended, Georgina suggested we go play pool in the basement. I hoped it would provide an opportunity for us to actually talk and get to know each other better away from her fanatically smiling mother. But Georgina had other intentions. She tried to corner me for a kiss multiple times down in the basement. I managed to evade her advances by pretending to be engrossed in our pool game. Just when Georgina was really putting the pressure on for a kiss, her mother yelled down the stairs that cinnamon rolls were ready. I've never been more grateful for baked goods being done. Upstairs, Georgina's enthusiastic mother handed me a warm cinnamon roll straight from the oven and informed me I simply must go meet Georgina's father now. He was seated at the far end of their giant dining room table, meticulously cleaning a large gun and wearing a jacket emblazoned with DEA in big letters. I'm not exaggerating. Georgina's father was casually polishing his firearms at the dinner table while decked out in what I can only assume was Drug Enforcement Administration gear. He greeted me with an ominous glare and interrogated me about where I knew his daughter from and how we had met. Growing up religious, I said we met through church. I'm pretty sure that was the only right answer to avoid him shooting me on the spot as an unworthy suitor for his daughter. Luckily, that response seemed sufficient for him not to end me. At this point, I was more than ready for the incredibly uncomfortable and awkward evening to end. I told Georgian I should really be heading home since I had an hour drive back. 
She walked me out to my car and leaned in for a kiss. I managed to evade by positioning my car door between us for protection. I drove barely out of sight of her house before pulling over, letting out the most cathartic primal scream to release the pent-up mortification. In hindsight, I can laugh a bit at the absolute insanity of that first date gone wrong, although at the time I was genuinely rattled for days. It was a valuable lesson to always video chat with someone first before meeting in person if you connect online, and to steer clear of intimate family events for early dates. I also realized I should have suggested a more casual, neutral setting for a first meetup rather than immediately agreeing to the dinner and a movie idea on a holiday. I clearly had no clue what I was walking into with Georgina and her aggressively friendly mom, creepy clingy behavior, and literal gun-wielding dad. Georgina seemed sweet and normal when we chatted online, but turned out to be someone looking for a committed relationship on the very first date and with no sense of boundaries. I promptly deleted Georgina's number and never contacted her again after the traumatic first date. I used the experience to learn to take things slower and keep early dates simple in public places. I waited a long time before attempting another online dating connection after Georgina. When I finally did, I made sure to have a few video chats first and suggest meeting for coffee rather than picking her up at home for a big planned evening. Having that nightmare first date with Georgina was mortifying at the time, but ended up giving me some much needed perspective. Now I can look back on it and shake my head at the crazy awkwardness while being grateful for the lessons it taught me about boundaries and being careful when online dating. Here's hoping my next first date goes smooth as can be. I still cringe when I think back on the horrific first date I had last year soon after moving to Asheville. I didn't know many people in town yet and was focused on pushing myself out of my comfort zone to make new friends. So when Troy, a guy from my journalism class, asked me how to dinner, I said yes without hesitating. In hindsight, that quick yes was my first mistake. Troy seemed nice enough in class. He always participated thoughtfully in discussions and was polite when we talked. I figured meeting up with him for dinner would be a nice, low-key way to get to know people in my new town. We'd agreed on a popular local restaurant downtown that came highly recommended by my coworkers. I arrived early at the restaurant and waited nervously at the bar, sipping the soda. Right on time, Troy walked in with a friendly smile that immediately put me at ease. We were seated at a cozy table in the back, and the first half of the dinner actually went well. Troy kept the conversation flowing with small talk about our journalism class and interests. He seemed genuinely curious about why I had moved to Asheville and offered recommendations on cool spots to check out around town. I was relieved we had some common ground and things to talk about. The food was delicious too, so I left dinner feeling that the date had gone smoothly. It was after dinner when the date took a turn. Troy suggested going to grab a drink at a bar called Jack of the Wood to continue the conversation. In hindsight, I should have made an excuse to end the date there, but I was trying to be more social so agreed to the bar idea, even though I'm not much of a drinker. I envisioned us having one drink each while chatting in a laid-back atmosphere. Oh, how wrong I was. As soon as we walked into Jack of the Wood, I realized this was more of a crowded club vibe with music blaring. People were crammed shoulder to shoulder and the noisy, chaotic atmosphere instantly made me anxious. I tend to avoid crowded, noisy places whenever possible, but I just silently followed Troy to the bar, not wanting to make a scene by asking to leave. Troy offered to buy me a drink, but seemed disappointed when I asked for just a soda. We could barely hear each other talk over the blaring music. He kept leaning close to my face trying to chat, which just made me shrink away further. I scanned the packed room for an escape, but there was nowhere to sit and every corner was crammed with people. After about 20 excruciating minutes of awkward attempts at conversation, Troy said he needed a cigarette and asked if I wanted to join him outside for some air. I despised cigarette smoke, so I declined. But I also didn't want to just stand alone inside the crowded bar, so I reluctantly followed him onto the crowded, chaotic patio. Of course, it was pouring rain outside. Troy casually leaned against the patio wall under the roof overhang and lit up a cigarette, seemingly unfazed. I huddled nearby trying in vain not to get soaked by the rain blowing under the roof. He kept trying to pull me further under the downpour, laughing about how it was romantic weather. Everything about this night was rapidly becoming the opposite of romantic. And that was only the beginning of the nightmare. Troy smoked one cigarette after another while rambling nonstop about all the different drugs he had done over the years. He seemed to think this was impressive conversation and kept nudging me to agree. I'd just politely reply a wow or that's crazy to most of what he said, while internally begging for this awful date to end. 
Of course, there were no taxes in sight with the bad weather. I was shivering under that patio roof for what felt like hours listening to Troy's rambling stories of substance abuse. The rain showed no signs of letting up. Finally, after his third or fourth cigarette, Troy suggested leaving the bar to go to one more spot. Hard nope. I quickly made up an excuse that I had to get home urgently to let my dog out. Total lie since I don't have a dog, but I was desperate. Troy seemed really irritated but said he would walk me in my car. The awkward silence on that walk back felt endless. I couldn't get to my car fast enough. As soon as we got to my car, I jumped in and muttered a polite good night before Troy could even reply. I cranked up my favorite empowering music and peeled out of that parking lot like my life depended on it. Part of me worried Troy would be offended by my abrupt exit, but a larger part just felt relieved that the night was finally over. I drove straight home, changed into comfy pajamas, and tried to forget the miserable events of the evening. Needless to say, Troy did not get a second date or even a return text from me. I learned my lesson to not ignore red flags just because someone seems nice initially, and to always listen to my intuition if a day idea seems uncomfortable or unappealing. Sticking through discomfort just to be polite is never worth it. Now I am much more cautious and selective when getting to know someone new. I make sure to have an exit plan if needed and suggest first aid ideas that fit my comfort zone. No more agreeing to crowded bars or late nights out with virtual strangers. The experience taught me to stand by my boundaries and preferences, even if it means disappointing someone else. My time and comfort are too valuable to waste on another unpleasant first date. The cringeworthy night with Troy left a lasting impact to only say yes to dates that feel right for me. No more forcing myself into bad situations just to appease someone else. I deserve better. I was feeling lonely after being single for so long. My friends were all starting to get married and have kids, making me feel like I was being left behind. I tried to fill my time with work, hobbies, and family, but there was still an emptiness from not having that special someone to share life with. So I finally decided to give online dating a try. I downloaded a few popular apps and spent an evening setting up my profiles. I uploaded some cute but honest photos of myself and tried to write an engaging bio that captured my personality. My friends helped me pick out the best pictures and made sure I didn't sound too desperate or canned. I was proud of my profiles but also nervous to put myself out there. What if no one liked me? Or only creeps messaged me? I had heard some online dating horror stories that made me worry. But I knew I needed to get past those fears if I ever wanted to meet someone. So I started swiping, sending some opening messages, and browsing through the hundreds of men's profiles in my area. Some seemed promising at first, others made me cringe immediately. But after about a week, I matched with Omar. His picture showed an athletic, blonde guy with sparkling blue eyes and a bright white smile. He looked like he could be a model or actor. I would never expected someone that handsome to be interested in plain old me. We started chatting through the app and really hit it off right away. Omar was attentive and interested in learning all about me. He asked thoughtful questions about my job, family, hobbies, and seemed genuinely engaged in my answers. I found myself rushing home from work eager to chat with Omar again. After a week or so of great messaging back and forth, Omar finally asked me out on an actual date. I was so excited but also incredibly nervous. This would be the first time meeting face to face. Thoughts raced through my mind about how he would react seeing me in person. Would he be disappointed that I wasn't as pretty as my photos? But I tried to push those insecurities aside and focus on how witty and charming he had been during our conversations. The day of the day I spent hours getting ready, carefully picking out my cutest outfit, and styling my hair just right. I wanted to look as attractive as possible for Omar. As I finished my makeup, my phone rang. It was him calling, which I thought was odd for just before a date. He said he didn't have cash on hand for parking where we were meeting and asked if I could cover him until he could pay me back. I thought it was a little strange he hadn't planned for parking but figured maybe he was just short on cash that day. I didn't want to start off our first date by being petty over a few dollars, so I said no problem. Omar then asked if I could also come outside to where he had already parked since he didn't want to lose the spot. Again, I thought it was odd, but I agreed to come down and pay for his parking until he could get to an ATM later. When I walked outside, I saw Omar's car and was really surprised. It was an old beater with rust spots and a big dent, nothing like the shiny BMW he had bragged about during our chats. The first seeds of doubt crept into my mind, but I tried to push them away. Maybe he was borrowing a friend's car or just going through a temporary setback. 
I didn't want to make any snap judgments and ruin the date right from the start. Omar greeted me with a big hug and a big grin. As we drove to the restaurant, he went out and on about his fancy car being the shop and bad luck with parking meters that day. I nodded politely while noticing all the inconsistencies piling up between what he had described online and what I was seeing in real life, but I still wanted to give Omar the benefit of the doubt. At dinner, over the loud restaurant noise, Omar told me all about his high-powered finance job and luxury apartment in the city. He ordered us expensive wine and appetizers. Everything seemed exaggerated compared to the old car and his casual outfit. When our entrees came, Omar conveniently went to the restroom just as the check arrived. I wondered if he expected me to pick up the tab without even offering. But again, I didn't want to assume the worst quite yet. When he returned, I said we could split the check and Omar didn't argue, but he also didn't apologize for sticking me with the bill temporarily. After dinner, Omar suggested we go check out a hot new club where his cousin was DJing that night. The club was crowded, noisy, and honestly not my scene at all for a first date. I would have preferred somewhere we could talk and actually get to know each other but Omar seemed excited to show off this cool happening club. We grabbed the only free table, a rickety tiny one tucked in the back corner. I could barely hear Omar over the music. After about 20 minutes, Omar's eyes started darting around the club wildly. I asked a few times if he was all right, but he seemed completely distracted. Then suddenly he froze, staring intensely at a petite blonde dancing with friends across the room. He muttered, Oh no, hits my ex Jen under his breath. Before I could respond, Omar jumped up saying he'd be right back and rushed off in Jenna's direction. And that was the last I saw of Omar all night. I sat at that table alone for over an hour just feeling like a complete idiot. He was clearly not coming back. No apologetic text or call either. I felt so foolish thinking someone as slick and charming as Omar could really be interested in plain old boring me. When I finally gave up waiting and ordered an Uber home that really sank in how badly I had messed up. Ignoring all those red flags just because I was so excited to have a handsome, witty guy actually like me. I clearly had been way too trusting because I was so eager to find someone after being single for so long. My friends tried to console me the next day by pointing out I was lucky to have learned the truth about Omar so early on. But I was still so embarrassed I had fallen for his act when there were clearly so many signs something was off. This experience was a huge wake-up call. I realized I need to be way more cautious and skeptical in online dating. People can completely fabricate an identity through curated photos and clever messaging. I let my desire for love and attention cloud my judgment. But now I understand the importance of taking time to really get to know someone before assuming you have a real connection, no matter how charming they seem at first. I was so excited when Charlie asked me out after we had hit it off seeing Sweet Caroline together at Hubby's bar. We really seemed to have a natural connection that night. He was cute, funny, and easy to talk to, so when he asked for my number, I happily gave it to him without hesitation. We made plans to hang out that weekend at his place, watch a movie first, then go out for a nice dinner afterwards. That Saturday evening, I showed up right on time to Charlie's house, mildly nervous but mostly optimistic for our first official date. He welcomed me inside with a friendly hug and smile. So far so good, I thought. Charlie seemed totally normal even charming as he led me on a quick tour around the first floor. Everything was going smoothly, and I was really looking forward to getting to know him better. As we headed downstairs to the luxury home theater Charlie had converted his basement into, I wondered aloud what movie he wanted to watch. But instead of naming some new rom-com or action flick, Charlie revealed he had put together an entire slideshow from his family's recent vacation to the Grand Canyon. He thought it would be more personal than just picking a random movie off Netflix. I tried not to let my smile falter too much. Sitting through a long presentation of someone else's trip didn't exactly sound like fun first date material, but Charlie looked so eager and excited to show me, I didn't want to shut him down right away. I settled onto the plush leather couch and prepared myself to be a captive yet positive audience. Charlie grabbed the remote control and the first breathtaking slide clicked onto the gigantic screen, a perfectly framed shot of the majestic Grand Canyon at sunrise. Or just right. Charlie gushed. I politely agreed and waited for the next click, expecting maybe a few dozen photos tops. But no, the next click brought another impeccably composed, professional quality photo of the canyon. And the next. And the next. Every single slide was just another indistinguishable angle of those same rocky cliffs and valleys. Charlie had hundreds of them from every possible time and position. 
After sitting through over 40 minutes of slide after slide of the canyon, my patience really started to wear dangerously thin. But Charlie was clearly in his element, enthusiastically narrating the trip down to the most minute detail. After finally exhausting every possible Grand Canyon shot, Charlie moved on to recapping their entire daily itinerary, every activity, restaurant, hotel, hike, and shop they visited, with the excitement of a kid describing their first trip to Disney World. I nodded along and tried to make the occasional wow, or that's awesome, comment when appropriate, despite having no context for most of these stories or people he mentioned. By the time we reached the Hoover Dam portion of the trip, I was fully zoning out, desperately checking my watch and willing the time to pass faster somehow. Just how many vacation photos did one family really need? At long last, after a grueling hour and 20 minutes, the final slide clicked off and the lights came back on. I heaved a silent sigh of relief, but Charlie showed no signs of wrapping up, continuing to ramble on about random details of the trip. I finally worked up the courage to politely interrupt, Hey Charlie, sorry to stop you, but we should probably start heading out for the restaurant now if we want to make our reservation. Charlie's eyes widened as he glanced at his watch and realized how late it had gotten. You're so right. Let me just freshen up really quick and change shirts. I breathed a huge internal sigh of relief, thinking we could finally move on to something, anything, else. As Charlie disappeared into his bedroom, I checked my appearance in a decorative mirror to make sure I looked okay after that marathon slideshow session. Just a few more minutes, I told myself, and we'd be out at a nice restaurant actually getting to know each other. I smiled thinking the night could still be salvaged. A minute later, I heard Charlie's footsteps approaching and turned expectantly, my smile instantly freezing into a look of horror. He had changed out of his jeans and t-shirt into nothing but a lime green, shimmery speedo. The famous Borat Mankini, to be exact. I was so shocked I almost wondered if I was being punked. But no, Charlie stood there beaming, looking extremely pleased with himself in the skin-tight swimsuit that left little to the imagination. He brightly asked, ready for dinner now. On the other hand, was desperately racking my brain trying to figure out how to escape this increasingly disastrous situation without completely humiliating either of us. I feebly mumbled that I was suddenly not feeling well and thought I should just head home. Charlie's face fell as he asked if I was really canceling our plans. I called over my shoulder that I was sorry as I already bolted up the stairs, saying we could try to reschedule dinner for another night. I burst out the front door without looking back, speed walking to my car while shaking my head in total disbelief and horror. What was supposed to be a fun first date had turned into the stuff of nightmares. Over the next few weeks, Charlie proceeded to bombard me with increasingly unhinged texts, calls, and voicemails begging for another chance. After the 20th voicemail, I finally just blocked his number altogether. So in summary, that was absolutely the worst first date of my entire life. Looking back now, I clearly should have recognized some major red flags right from the start, like when Charlie invited me over just to present his family's vacation slideshow instead of doing a normal movie dinner date. But not even my wildest imagination could have prepared me for him re-emerging in that absurd, cringe-worthy mankini like some Borat stunt double. I learned the hard way to be much more cautious and selective with men I meet, no matter how charming they first seem over karaoke. Charlie checked off pretty much every first date deal breaker in the book. It was a traumatic experience, but at least provided a valuable lesson moving forward on identifying mismatches early and not feeling pressured to stick around for a bad situation. The next time a guy asks me out, there will be no more forced slideshows, no questionable wardrobe reveals, and definitely no more chances. I'll be entering any new dating scenario with much healthier skepticism. I was brimming with excitement as I got ready for my coffee date with Matt. We had really hit it off chatting online over the past week, bonding over our shared interests in outdoor adventures, hootie hotspots, and doting our precious pets. I took extra time curling my hair and picking out a flirty sundress, daydreaming about how this could be the start of something special. When we decided to take things offline and meet up in person, I was thrilled at the possibilities. The drive to the coffee shop was filled with giddy anticipation of finally coming face to face with my online crush. I touched up my lipstick in the car and gave myself a little pep talk, hoping my nerves wouldn't show. As soon as I walked in and saw Matt smiling and waving at me from a table in the corner, my anxiety melted away. He looked just as handsome as in his photos, with warm brown eyes and an easy grin that made me blush. 
We exchanged slightly awkward but eager hellos as I settled into the chair across from him. So far, so good. But just as I was scooting my chair in and remarking on the cozy ambience, Matt slid a piece of paper across the table without a word. Puzzled, I glanced down to see a typed list of very personal questions. The first asked if I currently take any prescription medication, which gave me pause. That seemed like an overly intimate thing to just casually ask someone you've only interacted with online. I chalked it up to perhaps an awkward attempt at small talk about health or wellness. However, the next question asked if I had ever gotten a DUI. I felt my stomach drop, immediately realizing this was not simply friendly chit-chat. The final question inquired if I had ever been arrested for any reason. I sat staring at the paper, dumbfounded and increasingly uncomfortable as I processed this impromptu background check greeting me before we had even said more than two sentences to each other. When I finally looked up, Matt was just watching me expectantly, as if springing a questionnaire about my criminal and medical history on a first date was perfectly normal. I stammered out some excuse about needing to visit the restroom and hurried away from the table before he could see the shock and unease on my face. My mind reeled as I escaped to the back corner of the coffee shop. What was he thinking and bushing me with such wildly invasive questions the minute I sat down? Was this supposed to be his version of getting to know someone, interrogating them for any red flags or potentially sordid history? I couldn't imagine a more awkward and inappropriate way to start what I had hoped would be a pleasant meet-cute over coffee. In the bathroom, I stared at my bewildered expression in the mirror as I tried to figure out what to do next. Part of me wanted to grab my things and delete Matt's number, writing off this entire mortifying encounter but I also didn't want to just ghost him without at least trying to communicate why I found his approach so unsettling. I took a few minutes to splash cold water on my face, take a few deep breaths, and gather my courage. I decided I would go back out there and politely but firmly tell them the questionnaire was highly inappropriate, and I wouldn't be answering it or continuing this date. I just prayed I could get through that conversation without bursting into embarrassed tears. When I finally emerged from the bathroom, Matt didn't seem concerned at all at my abrupt exit. In fact, he looked a bit impatient, as if he couldn't understand what was taking me so long to complete his invasive trivia game. I sat back down and folded my hands tightly in my lap to hide their slight trembling. As calmly as I could manage, I told him I found the very personal questions completely inappropriate, and that no one should have to disclose private medical or legal information just to have coffee with someone. Matt looked surprised explaining that he was just trying to get to know the real me and weed out any red flags early on. He said he had used his handy questionnaire for the past five first dates with no complaints. He pressed me to stop being shy and just answer honestly to save us both some time if I did have anything potentially concerning to confess. I felt my anxiety turn to anger and disbelief. I reiterated firmly that his approach was a glaring red flag to me, and I found it insulting that he assumed he deserved access to such sensitive information about a complete stranger. I told him that I wouldn't be answering his questions or staying to continue this disastrous date. As I began gathering my purse to leave, he switched tactics and turned on the charm, imploring me not to judge him too harshly for looking out for his heart. He pleaded with me to at least sign the paper before I left, since he had typed it up special for me. I had reached my limit. I told Matt in no uncertain terms that I wouldn't be signing anything that I hoped he reflected on this experience. I advise that you reconsider how he screens dates, as interrogation does not equal intimacy or trust. With as much dignity as I could summon, I strode out of the coffee shop without looking back, leaving him sputtering apologies at my rapidly retreating figure. My hands were trembling as I climbed into my car, equal parts rattled and livid over how quickly my eager anticipation had turned to horror. I was proud of myself for recognizing Matt's behavior as unacceptable and refusing to go along with it, no matter how much he tried to justify his actions but my anger was edged with sadness about how he had ruined not just a date, but the lovely possibilities I had imagined based on conversations. I drove home feeling silly for the time I had spent gushing about this man to my friends and mentally dressing up for what ended up being a nightmare scenario. When I got home, I immediately deleted Matt's number and our dating app exchanges, not wanting any reminders of him on my phone. I knew I had ultimately dodged a bullet, but was still disappointed at having my hopeful romantic notions trampled so jarringly. I changed into pajamas, made myself some calming tea, and cuddled with my cat, finding solace in his affectionate purrs. As I recounted the story to my roommate and a few close friends, I got the validation and sympathy I needed to start shaking off the uncomfortable encounter. While certainly my most horrifying first date by far, it was also an important learning experience, 
It reminded me to always listen to my gut. If something feels wrong or invasive, I'll allow it to politely decline, express my feelings, and remove myself, even if it seems awkward. This man's misguided screening methods wouldn't discourage me from continuing to date, but it did teach me what red flags to watch out for and reinforce setting boundaries from the very first meeting. I still vividly remember every cringe-worthy detail of that horrific blind date from about 10 years ago. It was the summer I had to turn 30 and finally caved to pressure for my mom to settle down. She insisted no decent man would want a career-focused woman nearing her 30s who was still tragically single. I scoffed at her old-fashioned views, but deep down I was starting to worry she may be right. So despite my better judgment, I shelled out an insane amount of money into one of those elite matchmaking services that promised to set me up with marriage material men. The agency's website boasted about their high success rates and showed pictures of supposedly happily married couples they had matched. Desperate for a real connection, I hoped the matchmakers truly had some magical formula to find my soulmate. The day of the big blind date, I showed up early at the casual little pizza place we had agreed to meet at. I sat at the small table nervously sipping ice water and checking my watch every two minutes. Fifteen minutes late turned into thirty, which stretched to an outrageous forty-five minutes before my date strolled in like he owned the place. My shoulders slumped when I saw him saunter through the doors in an obnoxious shiny designer suit that probably cost more than my monthly rent. He clearly had an exaggerated sense of self-importance as he dramatically removed his designer sunglasses and ran a hand through his overly gelled hair. Trailing behind him were several rough-looking men who looked less like friends and more like bodyguards or criminal cronies. The man scanned the restaurant imperiously until his beady eyes settled on me, lighting up with a predatorial gleam that sent a shiver down my spine. He strutted over and plopped down the chair across from me. I braced myself, expecting an apology for his extreme tardiness, but instead he leered at me loudly enough to turn most heads in the restaurant. I considered walking out right then and there, but didn't want to be rude. So I sat there rigidly as he prattled on about his import-slash-export business, in a tome laden with innuendo that suggested less than legal dealings. His eyes were glued to my body the whole time, looking at me like a conquest, not a date. When the waitress came over, he shooed her away, insisting he would order for me. I was perfectly capable of ordering my own food, but he clearly wanted to exert domineering power. The dish he attempted to order sounded positively revolting. I quickly cut in to correct the order, which made him scowl briefly before plastering his smug grin back on. Throughout the endless meal, he dominated the conversation talking about his supposed wealth, connections, and larger-than-life lifestyle. His pack of friends chuckled at his arrogant jokes and seemed to follow his every cue. I stayed mostly silent, repulsed by his inflated ego and trying subtly to leave soon but he either didn't notice or simply ignored my signals. After what felt like hours of listening to him boast, I finally forced myself to stand up and say I had to leave. As I gathered my purse, he suddenly slapped me inappropriately and gestured for me to go. I hurried out feeling shaken, violated, and furious that I had wasted time and money on this matchmaking agency only to end up in such a demeaning situation. As I drove away, I checked the rearview mirror for any signs of that all for his thuggish cronies following me. I vowed I would never again depend on some company's formulas to find me a man. When I got home, I scrubbed my skin in the shower, almost violently trying to wash away the feeling of his unwanted touch. I cried realizing I had been so focused on what society expected from a single 30-year-old woman that I lost touch with my own wants and needs. Over the next few weeks, I started taking better care of myself by picking up hobbies that brought me genuine joy. I reconnected with old friends and did more independent things that boosted my confidence. I decided if my mom ever recommended another matchmaker, I'd stop speaking to her. Slowly, I became more fulfilled in myself and stopped viewing romantic partnership as the be all and all of a woman's happiness. By focusing inward, I found a new path forward. And then surprisingly, after I had stopped trying so hard to find the one, I met a wonderful man named Mark through mutual friends. Our shared interests and values were evident from our first coffee date, when we talked for hours like old friends. Unlike that arrogant blowhard from the matchmaking debacle, Mark was humble, respectful, and full of thought-provoking insights. He never objectified me or acted superior. We were equals bonding over a true mental connection. Now, almost seven years after that nightmare blind date, Mark and I have built a beautiful life together, growing even closer through ups and downs we've weathered side by side. 
Looking back, I can even find gratitude for that traumatic matchmaking experience because it taught me difficult but necessary lessons. I realized I deserve more than what society or my family expects of me. I learned to become whole on my own rather than desperately seeking completion through the wrong romantic partner. I understood my self-worth and refused to compromise it again. Without that wake-up call, I may have ended up on an unhealthy relationship path. But by removing myself from a bad situation and doing personal work to regain my confidence, I found the fulfilling love I had hoped for all along. Now I feel wiser and more optimistic about the next chapter ahead. It was supposed to be a simple, relaxed movie night. Just me, the guy I'd been talking to online for a few weeks, and the comfortable familiarity of my living room. When he first asked me out, I was excited. We'd been flirting quite a bit, and meeting in person felt like the natural next step. I suggested coming over to my place rather than going out somewhere. I figured a casual, private setting would be ideal for getting to know each other one-on-one -on -one for the first time. He arrived right on time, looking just as cute as his pictures, but a bit more nervous. I couldn't blame him. First dates are always a little nerve-wracking. All that pressure and uncertainty about how things will go. We exchanged slightly awkward hellos and settled onto the couch, where I'd set up Netflix on the TV. As we browsed titles and debated which movie to watch, the conversation began to flow more easily. He had a great sense of humor that put me at ease. I was really enjoying his company. About 20 minutes into the movie we'd settled on, I was feeling relaxed and optimistic about where the state was going. That hopeful feeling evaporated instantly when a sudden loud thud sounded from the direction of my bedroom down the hall. We both flinched, my heartbeat quickening as I tried to figure out what could have caused the noise. Probably just the house settling, I said with a casual shrug, not wanting my date to see how rattled I felt. He seemed to accept this, turning his focus back to the movie, but I remained tense and alert. Moments later, another noise jolted me, even louder this time, a heavy thump followed by the unmistakable sound of something toppling over. A date turned to me, eyes wide. You heard that too, right? I could only nod, dread creeping over me. In the lingering silence that followed, I strained to listen for any other sounds, but heard nothing. After what felt like an eternity, my date broke the quiet. Should we check it out? His voice shook with the same fear I felt. Every instinct told me to say no, pretend it was nothing, but I knew we had to investigate. Reluctantly, I followed as he rose from the couch and crept down the shadowy hall toward the bedroom, my heart thudding. He gestured for me to hang back as he eased open the door a crack and peered inside. After a few agonizingly long moments, he pulled back, face pale. There's someone in there, he mouthed silently. I thought my legs might give out. A stranger in my bedroom. This was rapidly becoming a nightmare. Before I could even process this terrifying information, the unmistakable creak of a door opening reached our ears. We exchanged panicked looks. Whoever it was knew we were here now. My date grabbed my hand and hurried us on trembling legs back down the hall toward the safety of the front door. We had to get out to call for help before this intruder appeared. We were nearly there when a figure stepped out from the darkness and into our path, a disheveled, wild-eyed woman I'd vaguely recognized but couldn't immediately place. Shock rendered me speechless. Leaving so soon, the woman asked with a chilling smile. My date moved in front of me protectively. We're calling the police. He stated as firmly as he could, though his voice shook. The woman let out a bone-chilling, mirthless laugh. Go ahead and call, but I won't let her get away from me again. Her eyes burned into mine, and with dawning horror, I realized why she looked familiar. An old friend I'd had a messy falling out with months ago and not spoken to since. How had she gotten inside? And what was she planning to do? Before I could utter a word, she lunged toward us. My date yanked open the front door and pulled me along with him, sprinting to his car. I could only pray the woman wasn't following us. Safe inside with the doors locked, we sat for a moment catching our breath. My mind was flooded with questions, but all I could manage to say was, we need to call the police now. As he dialed, I shook with adrenaline, unable to believe this was really happening. I kept glancing around outside, irrationally expecting to see the woman emerge from the shadows. The cops arrived in minutes, and I shakily explained the situation. After searching inside and out, they reported no sign of an intruder. But I knew she'd been in there. The vivid image of her wild eyes was seared into my mind. My date drove me to his place, not wanting to leave me alone after the traumatic experience. As we pulled into his driveway, he gave my hand a comforting squeeze. The one place I always felt safe my home had been violated in the worst possible way. Over the next few days, my anxiety remained high. 
I kept picturing the woman lurking in the shadows, waiting for me. I knew it wasn't rational. The police had said she was likely long gone that night. But I couldn't shake the creepy certainty that she was still out there somewhere, wanting to hurt me. Every small noise made me jump. I started triple-checking that every door and window was locked tight before bed. Deep down, I knew this wasn't over. She had an axe to grind, and I was a target. The date that was supposed to be a fun first meeting had instead morphed into the opening scene of a real-life horror film. And I couldn't stop wondering fearfully what scene would come next. I don't think I'll ever forget that fateful night. It was supposed to be a simple first date. Meet up with James, someone I'd have been chatting with online for a few weeks, have dinner together, and see if we clicked in real life. I had no way of knowing then that agreeing to that date would lead to a terrifying night that still haunts my dreams. When I arrived at the restaurant, a trendy farm-to-table place I had picked out for our first meetup, I immediately spotted James standing near the hostess station. He looked exactly like his photos, tall and athletic with warm brown eyes and a bright smile. We exchanged slightly awkward first date hugs, and then the hostess led us to a cozy corner table. As we settled in and looked over the menus, we slipped into relaxed conversation. James told me funny stories from work, asked thoughtful questions about my hobbies, and made flattering comments about my dress. I found myself laughing and lowering my guard. This was going even better than I had hoped. After we finished eating, James insisted on driving me home so we could continue the date a little longer. Grateful for the traveler's offer, I happily accepted. We walked through the parking lot to his shiny black luxury set-in as he opened the passenger door for me with a smile. I slid into the leather seat, buckled my seatbelt, and leaned back, feeling optimistic about where the night was heading. But as soon as we pulled out of the parking lot, instead of turning towards my neighborhood, James went the opposite direction down an unfamiliar road. I pointed this out nervously, and he casually brushed it off, saying he wanted to show me a surprise first. My stomach dropped even as I told myself I was probably overreacting. We drove on in tense silence, the bright lights of the city fading behind us as we entered a remote wooded area. I did my best to stay calm, watching the shadowy trees race past my window. After what felt like an eternity of winding through darkness down narrow country back roads, James abruptly pulled the car off the road. Up ahead, the headlights faintly illuminated an abandoned farmhouse. Before I could react, he reached over and pressed a button by my seat, locking all the doors with a mechanical clump that made my blood turn cold. Fear started creeping through my body in icy tendrils, but I frantically told myself to stay rational. This had to be some kind of misunderstanding. James turned off the engine and angled himself towards me with an eager glint in his eye that turned my stomach. When he told me in a low voice that we were alone out here for a reason, the sinister threat behind his words made my heart pound wildly. I pleaded with him to just take me home, but he simply chuckled darkly, obviously enjoying the control he now held over me. The alarm bells ringing in my head grew deafening when he retrieved a bundle of handcuffs and restraints from the back seat, slowly unwrapping them as if to tease me with my impending fate. I knew I needed to escape this vehicle as quickly as possible by any means necessary. I desperately tried the door handle even though I knew it was useless. The car had become a prison I couldn't break free from. Fear flooded my body with adrenaline, and without thinking, I started frantically kicking at the passenger door. After several forceful kicks, the door unexpectedly popped open just enough for me to wedge myself out. I tumbled onto the dark dirt road, my knees and elbows scraping painfully against the rough ground. But I didn't have time to worry about injuries now. I had to run. I sprinted towards a crumbling abandoned farmhouse up ahead, my only chance at shelter. I could hear James shouting after me, his footsteps rapidly gaining ground as he pursued me. I ran faster than I ever had in my life, my lungs burning and legs aching. At last, I reached the farmhouse, bursting through the creaky front door into the dark depths of the dilapidated structure. I desperately searched every room, looking for somewhere to hide from the danger outside. In my panic, I could barely process my surroundings beyond scanning for possible shelters. My frantic footsteps echoed through the empty rooms, amplifying my terror. Finally, I settled in a closet in the very back room, maneuvering myself among the musty coats and trying to quiet my ragged breathing. I could hear James stomping around the farmhouse, calling my name in a tone that shifted erratically between anger and excitement. I froze in the closet, praying the walls would conceal me until he gave up searching. As I sat paralyzed in darkness, listening to his footsteps fade in and out, time seemed to slow. 
each second stretched out interminably, my mind conjuring horrific visions of what he would do if he found me. After what felt like hours of being locked in horror in the confines of the closet, I finally heard James' voice and footsteps retreat fully. I didn't dare move a muscle until I was absolutely positive he had left the area. With my heart threatening to pound out of my chest, I slowly exited the closet. I crept towards the front door on high alert, ready to hide again at the slightest sound. Reaching the exit without incident, I rushed out into the night, running as if my life depended on it. My legs pumped with adrenaline as I fled that nightmare farmhouse, sprinting faster and farther than I thought possible. I didn't care where I ended up, as long as it was far from the horror I had just narrowly escaped. Just as I felt I could not physically run any further, I came across a passing car. I frantically flagged them down, and they allowed me to use their phone to call the police. I paced by the side of the road as I waited for the authorities, racked with sobs now that the immediate danger had passed. My whole body trembled in delayed reaction, my mind reeling to process the trauma. My innocence and trust were shattered in one night. But I told myself to focus on the relief that I had escaped and survived. With time, perhaps I could rebuild what was lost and learn to not ignore the subtle warnings again. For now, I was simply grateful to walk away from that first date from hell with my life. I should have known something was off from the moment he walked through the door to pick me up. There was a wild, unfocused look in his eyes that immediately put me on edge. His clothes were wrinkled and disheveled in a way that seemed out of character for his usually well-put-together appearance. The collar of his shirt was popped up on one side like he hadn't even looked in a mirror, and there was a small stain near the bottom that I tried not to stare at. As we made stilted small talk on the way to his car, I could detect the faint smell of alcohol already wafting from him, even though it was only 6 p.m. The drive to the restaurant was even more unsettling. He sped erratically, drifting between lanes and making sudden, jerking motions with a wheel that made me grab the door handle in panic. At one point, he ran a red light just as cross-traffic was starting to move through the intersection. The cacophony of blaring horns was deafening. I clutched my seatbelt tightly and considered pretending I was feeling sick to ask if we could reschedule. But some small, naive part of me clung to the hope that maybe he was just nervous for our first date and that his behavior would improve once we settled in at the restaurant. Against my better judgment, I stayed quiet and went along with him into the restaurant. The hostess led us to a small table tucked away in a secluded corner of the dining room, the flickering candle on the table doing little to dispel the gloom settling around us. I shivered, feeling like I was being led into a cave. As soon as we sat down, my date hurriedly ordered a glass of wine and drank it so fast I worried he'd make himself sick. I stared at him over my menu, wide-eyed, as he polished off the large glass within a few minutes and quickly waved down the server for a refill. I hesitated when the server looked to me, but ordered a small glass of white wine just to have something to do with my hands. By the time our server returned with the second round, the knot in my stomach had tightened so much I could barely look at the menu options, let alone imagine eating. Everything about the situation fell off. The charming, put-together guy who had asked me out a few days ago now seemed like a complete stranger. I watched uneasily as he gulped his second glass of wine, becoming increasingly loud and erratic. He was able to carry on semi-normal conversation at first, though I could hear the pronounced slur in his words when he spoke. I tried gently steering our small talk toward positive topics like work, books, or family. But it quickly became clear his filter was gone, along with any sense of polite decorum. Soon, he began making callous, inappropriate comments about our server and other patrons within Urshot, not even attempting to keep his voice down. The older couple seated at the table next to us kept shooting horrified glances in our direction and eventually asked who he moved. I felt my face burn hot with embarrassment and stared down at my laugh. When I tried discreetly suggesting in a low voice that he keep it down, he only seemed to get more confrontational, as if my polite rebuff had flipped a switch in him. The cavernous interior of the restaurant now seemed suffocating. I realized with nausea that his behavior continued to escalate, we were relatively isolated without easy access to help. There were only a handful of other customers scattered through the large, open space, and our table was tucked away in a shadowy corner, obscured from view. I had the exits calculatingly, caging if I could make it out of here gracefully if things went further south. In a last-ditch attempt to salvage the night, I suggested we skip ordering dinner and call it an early night. But he reacted explosively, pounding his fist loudly on the table and causing the silverware to jump and clatter. I jumped too, my heart hammering against my ribs. 
The thwack of his fist against the wooden table seemed to echo through the room. He erected a stream of slurred profanity at me that made the two young women dining a few tables away gather their purses and shuffle farther away, casting me sympathetic glances over their shoulders. My date's face was mottled red with rage and inebriation, eyes bloodshot and spittle flying from his mouth. In that instant, I knew I needed to remove myself from the situation immediately, no matter what it took. On shaking legs, I gathered my things as quickly as I could. I thought I heard him yell something after me, but I didn't turn around or dare look back. I kept walking steadily toward the exit, resisting the urge to break into a frantic run. I was acutely aware of the many eyes following me as I made my escape. Practically sprinting through the parking lot, I fumbled to unlock my car door, half expecting him to come barreling out of the restaurant in pursuit, but he never appeared. Safely locked inside, I took several deep breaths to slow my racing heart. After a few minutes of scanning the dark lot apprehensively, I finally found the courage to start the engine and pull away. I decided to just drive for a while, too shaken to face going home quite yet. The knot in my stomach remained as I aimlessly navigated through unfamiliar neighborhoods, watching streetlights pass by in a blur. Nearly an hour later, I finally made my way back to my apartment. I kept checking the rearview mirror, still irrationally fearful he had somehow tracked down where I lived and would come after me. I parked around the back of the complex just in case, tucked away from view of the main road. For the next few days, I barely slept, jumping at every little creak and groan that echoed through my small apartment. I realized just how isolated and vulnerable I was living alone on the third floor. In hindsight, I'm still embarrassed it took me so long to listen to my instincts. I should have ended things the second I saw the state he was in. But it was a harsh lesson on learning to trust my gut in the future. First impressions and red flags exist for a reason, as women were conditioned to give men the benefit of the doubt, but sometimes that doubt can come at the cost of our own safety. Unfortunate things didn't escalate further in the restaurant, but the aftermath left me badly shaken. Not everyone escapes so unscathed. The most important thing is being able to recognize a dangerous situation and remove yourself from it swiftly, even if it means being rude or overreacting. Your well-being should always take priority. I kept thinking back to those sympathetic eyes following me out. They understood. Don't second-guess yourself or let fear of social judgment cloud your judgment. If someone's behavior is making you feel unsafe, you don't owe them anything. Get out of there and get somewhere you feel protected. Your life is worth so much more than awkwardness or bruised egos. Trust your gut and do what you need to do to stay safe. No date is worth taking risks with your personal safety. I still vividly remember every moment of my first date with Lavi last year. We had matched on a dating app a few weeks prior and hit it off right away. Her profile picture showed a gorgeous girl with long brown hair and a radiant smile. She came across as charismatic and outgoing over text. I felt an instant connection, which is rare for me on dating apps. I was thrilled when she agreed to meet up for coffee. I arrived at the bustling cafe early and grabbed a table by the window so I could watch for Lily outside. The minutes crawled by as I anxiously awaited her arrival. I sipped my water and fidgeted with my phone, wondering if she would actually show up or leave me hanging. At exactly 5 p.m., I noticed a pretty brunette peering around the entrance. Her eyes landed on me, and she waved excitedly before walking over. You must be Alex. I'm Lily. It's so wonderful to finally meet you, she gushed, leaning in for a quick hug. I caught a whiff of lavender and vanilla as I embraced her. She looked just like her photos, stylish, slender, and radiating charm. We sat across from each other, and a waitress promptly came by for our orders. I asked for an iced coffee while Lily requested a vanilla latte with oat milk. I noted that even her drink order seemed delicate and sweet, fitting her persona. We quickly fell into a lively conversation that felt natural and engaging. Lily told me about her passion for photography, which she hoped to turn into a full-time career soon. She regaled me with tales of traveling across Southeast Asia for a month, exploring remote islands and taking thousands of pictures. As an avid backpacker myself, I hung on every detail, from the vibrant night markets in Bangkok to swimming under waterfalls in the jungle. In turn, I opened up about my job in finance, which I found boring but paid well, and my dreams of starting a rock band since I played guitar for years. Lily's eyes would light up, and she gently touched my arm when I shared something personal. I couldn't believe I had met someone so expressive and warm. I knew in my gut that this first date was special. As the minutes flew by, however, I gradually noticed puzzling inconsistencies in Lily's stories. 
First, she told me about attending a wedding in Thailand with her sister, but later she referenced learning to scuba dive in Thailand with a boyfriend. She brought a few beautiful secluded hiking trails near the city that she loved, but the details shifted each time. Little things but red flags nonetheless. When our coffee orders arrived, Lily's friendly questions took a more prompting turn. Had I ever been arrested or in a fight? Were my parents still married and what were they like? Did I have any crazy ex-girlfriends who hated me now? It seemed odd for our first date, almost like she was trying to uncover dirt on me. I gently steered the conversation back to travel and music, but she persisted with the personal questions, refusing to let them go. As the uneasy feeling in my gut grew, I excused myself to use the restroom. While I was washing my hands, the door opened and I heard whispered arguing just outside. I peeked out and saw two cafe employees harshly confronting Lily at our table, telling her she needed to leave immediately. Lally looked distraught, begging them not to make her leave. One barista noticed me watching with confusion. He came over and quietly explained that Lily had a disturbing history of tricking men into meeting her here on false pretenses. She would then manipulate and verbally abuse them once they were face to face. This wasn't the first time they'd had to intervene and kick her out. I sat back down, stunned at this revelation. I replayed the date in my mind, seeing all the warning signs I had naively ignored. The inconsistencies in her stories, the probing personal questions about my past, her overly flattering personality, it all suddenly seemed like an act to get me off guard. I felt ashamed that I had fallen for it and opened up about private details of my own life. What if I had agreed to go somewhere more isolated with her afterward? The barista came by again to apologize for the ugly scene. He reassured me that far more savvy men had also been duped by Lily in the past. She knew exactly how to manipulate trusting guys on first dates. I thanked her profusely for the heads up, though my pride was wounded at being so foolish. I left the cafe in a daze, wondering how I could have misjudged Lily so completely. In the following days, I did some research online and found local news articles detailing Lily's extensive criminal history of fraud, theft, and assault charges. She had a clear pattern of luring men on dates to isolate and take advantage of them. I realized how much worse the encounter could have gone without the staff intervening. The whole experience left me rattled and untrusting. Now I'm much more wary when meeting someone new. At any sign of inconsistent stories or overly pushy behavior, I'm ready to end the date. I listen to my gut instinct more if something feels off. My friends still poke fun and call Lily my date from hell, but it taught me important lessons about looking for red flags and staying safe. Dating is always a risk, but being vigilant protects me from winding up in another situation like that cafe with Lily ever again. I have been chatting with Mark online for a few weeks, and we really seemed to hit it off. He was smart, funny, and charming in our messages back and forth. When he suggested meeting up for a first day at his apartment for a home-cooked meal, I was thrilled. I took extra care getting ready, making sure my outfit and hair were just right. This guy seemed really special, and I didn't want to mess anything up. As I drove to Mark's place, I felt both nervous and excited. I went over the flirty conversations we'd had in my head, reminiscing about how thoughtful and interested he seemed in getting to know me. When I arrived at his apartment building, I took a deep breath to steady my nerves before going inside. Mark greeted me at the door with a warm, enthusiastic smile. He gave me a quick tour of his tiny apartment, showing off the modern artwork and sleek furniture. I was impressed by his decorating skills. Everything looked freshly cleaned and welcoming. The delicious aroma of tomatoes and herbs filled the air as we headed to the kitchen. On the stove, a pot of pasta sauce simmered next to a boiling pot of noodles. Mark poured us both a glass of red wine and we clinked our glasses together in a cheers. As we waited for the pasta to finish cooking, Mark asked me engaging questions about my job, my hobbies, and my family. I found myself opening up easily, chatting and laughing together like old friends. He was an intent listener, his eyes focused on me as I talked, laughing at all my lame jokes. The initial nervousness I felt dissipated as we fell into an effortless rapport. When the food was ready, Mark served up heaping plates of pasta drizzled with a rich, flavorful sauce. Over dinner, the conversation flowed smoothly, wandering from our favorite travel destinations to embarrassing childhood stories. I was really enjoying myself. Mark was even more charming and thoughtful in person than he had been online. As we finished up our meals, I was feeling an undeniable connection growing between us. This first date was exceeding all my expectations. After dinner, Mark offered to show me around the rest of his apartment. 
as we wandered into the living room, I paused to admire a framed photo on the wall. It was a striking black and white landscape. Without thinking, I reached out to take a closer look. Clumsy me, my hand bumped the frame and sent it crashing to the ground. The glass shattered loudly across the hardwood floors. I immediately apologized profusely, feeling like an idiot for breaking his nice decoration. As I bent to pick up the frame, I noticed something odd behind where it had hung. A small black camera was mounted to the wall, its lens peeking out. My heartbeat quickened, wondering why a camera would be hidden there. I looked around slowly, taking in the room with new eyes. Could there be more cameras concealed around the apartment, spying on our date? I moved carefully into the hallway, scanning the walls and fixtures intently. My eyes landed on what appeared to be a light switch, but on closer inspection was definitely a hidden camera. My stomach flipped anxiously, realizing he had been recording me without my knowledge. In the bedroom, an ornamental vase held another tiny camera lens among the flowers. My mind reeled with how long he had been watching me, feeling exposed and unsettled. I confronted Mark, heeding my voice steady as I pointed out the hidden cameras around his home. In an instant, his warm demeanor vanished, his face twisted in anger as he snapped at me for snooping and violating his privacy. He began shouting and accusing me of impropriety. I froze momentarily, startled by his sudden, frightening temper. It was clear I needed to remove myself from the situation immediately. I bolted toward the front door, hearing Mark's bellowing threats behind me. I fumbled to unlock the door with shaking hands as he charged after me. Finally pulling it open, I ran blindly to my car, terrified he might catch me before I could get away. I peeled out of the parking lot, catching a glimpse of Mark's enraged face watching me from his door. My hands trembled on the steering wheel as I drove, replaying the petrifying turn of events. Nausea washed over me thinking of the intimate evening I had unknowingly shared with hidden observers. I chastised myself for ignoring subtle red flags in our earlier conversations. His possessive wording about my girl or not wanting to share me now seemed ominous rather than flattering. Arriving home, I resisted the urge to curl up under the covers and shut out the world. As deeply disturbing as it was, I knew I had to report what transpired for my own safety. The next morning, I recounted the story as steadily as I could to the police. They documented my report, though warned the lack of evidence limited their options. I felt empowered nonetheless for standing up against Mark's harassment. In the following weeks, I oscillated between feeling violated and feeling furious with myself for being so foolish. Rationally, I knew Mark's disturbing behavior was not my fault but I continuously scrutinized our past interactions for any clue I should have noticed. My friends assured me there was no way I could have known based on our friendly conversations. I replayed our encounter in my mind endlessly, the way he looked at me hanging on his every word, the charming laughter, the menacing threats. My feelings swung wildly from anger to regret to fear. Some nights I startled awake from nightmares of what could have been. Other nights I stayed up too wired to sleep, watching for any unfamiliar cars on my street. Gradually, the intensity of my emotions lessened from a roar to a dull ache. I no longer felt afraid to leave my apartment or be alone. I stopped blaming myself every day. I knew accepting what happened was the only way to take my life back. Mark may have stolen my power for a brief, terrifying moment, but I refused to let him ruin my spirit or trust in others. I was positively giddy as I got ready for my date with David. We had met a couple weekends prior at a networking mixer for young professionals. I still remember walking up to introduce myself, unable to take my eyes off his handsome face, charming smile, and sharp business casual wardrobe. We instantly hit it off, chatting easily about our careers, hobbies, and favorite TV shows. I could feel a definite connection between us. David asked for my number before leaving that night, and I gladly gave it to him. When he called a few days later asking me out to dinner, I was over the moon. David suggested a new upscale restaurant downtown that had been getting rave reviews. I immediately started planning what to wear and which of my best dating stories I would tell him. This was shaping up to be a first date worthy of a romantic comedy montage. The afternoon of the big night, I meticulously styled my hair in soft curls and did my makeup with more precision than usual. I chose an elegant black cocktail dress that I hoped struck the perfect balance between casual and formal. Spritzing on my favorite perfume, I felt ready for what I hoped could potentially turn into a real relationship. David seemed so promising. Right on time, David pulled up outside my apartment building looking as handsome as ever. 
When I climbed into his spotless luxury SUV, he greeted me with a broad smile and handed me a beautiful bouquet of roses and lilies, my favorite. As we drove to the restaurant, we chatted effortlessly about work, family, and pop culture, and I found myself laughing more than I had in ages. Everything just felt so natural with David. When we arrived at the restaurant, I audibly gasped. Crystal chandeliers, velvet booths, marble floors. The place was absolutely stunning. The waiter promptly showed us to an intimate table in the back corner, away from the hustle and bustle. David insisted we start with a bottle of their most expensive champagne. I was already impressed by his refined tastes. Over appetizers of oysters, Rockefeller, and Bereta Capris, David asked thoughtful questions about my childhood, career goals, and dreams of future travel. He actually listened and cared about my responses. I found myself opening up to him about past heartbreaks and family struggles, topics I usually avoid on first dates. With David, I felt safe being vulnerable. During the main course, David suggested we sample a variety of dishes to share. We enjoyed tender filet mignon, buttery lobster risotto, and exotic mushrooms flown in from Italy. I was amazed David knew exactly which gourmet foods to pick at such a high-end establishment. He truly was a man of distinguished tastes. Just as dessert arrived, a molten chocolate lava cake with fresh berries, David politely excused himself to take an important business call. He ran his own consulting firm, so I understood clients would need him at all hours. He smiled apologetically, squeezed my hand in his strong yet gentle grip, and promised to return shortly. I smiled back reassuringly and urged him to take his time. Ten minutes passed, then twenty, then thirty. Butting my lip anxiously, I kept glancing around, hoping to spot David returning. Other diners shot me pitying looks as I sat alone picking at the extravagant cake. I asked the waiter if he had seen where my date went, but he just shrugged unhelpfully. I tried texting David, but received no response. My stomach began to sink as I realized something was very wrong here. Finally garnering my courage, I went to ask the host if I could leave, since David had apparently ditched me. The host broke the news that legally I was required to pay the astronomical bill, since the card on file was for a David Miller. I stood there in shock, hands shaking, as I handed over my credit card for over $300 worth of uneaten food and champagne. The full truth dawned on me as the ballet brought my car around. David had targeted me to fund his expensive tastes. He never planned to return after stepping away to take a call. Everything up until that point, the charm, romance, attention, it had all been an act to manipulate me into paying for his ostentatious dinner. Who knew how many other women he had deceived like this? I felt so foolish for falling for it. On the ride home, tears stung my eyes as I replayed the disastrous state in my mind. The signs of David's duplicity became glaringly obvious in hindsight. How could I not have realized sooner that something was amiss? I felt violated, used, and deeply ashamed at my naivety. This was not at all how I imagined my fairy tale first date unfolding. Once home, I broke down and cried into my pillow like a heartbroken teenager. I really thought David cared for the real me. Fight in the eye was just his unwitting meal ticket was utterly devastating. I felt so stupid for being sweet-talked by a scammer. All my trust and optimism about dating felt shattered. In the morning, I tried explaining the scam situation to the restaurant manager, but they said the bill had already been processed. Reluctantly, I filed a police report on David, though I doubted much would come of it. I also posted warnings about him on all my social media accounts, so no other woman would fall prey to his deception. This experience has unfortunately left me quite jaded about dating. I used to be such a hopeful romantic, but after David, I feel unable to open my heart easily again. Every nice gesture from a man now seems suspect. Who's to say it's not just a ploy to manipulate me? It pains me that one man's despicable lies can corrode my ability to trust. But fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. At least now I know the warning signs to avoid falling for another David. From now on, I will trust actions over charming words and promises. My rose-colored glasses are officially off. I still can't believe I agreed to this blind date that my buddy set up. I haven't dated much since Amy disappeared over a year ago. Thinking about her still gives me chills. The police never found out what happened to her after she left my apartment that night. Her car was still in the parking lot and her purse left on my kitchen counter. She had no reason to just vanish that I could understand. I cooperated fully with the police, even though I could tell they suspected me initially. 
After months of interrogations and investigating Amy's life, they concluded she had no reason to run away. It was like she just evaporated into thin air. I constantly racked my brain trying to remember any clue from our last night together. We had gotten into an argument, but it was over something trivial like we always did. She had accused me of flirting with another girl I knew from work. I insisted it was innocent, friendly chatting. Amy threatened to leave me over it. I apologized and tried to calm her down, but she grabbed her coat in a huff and left my apartment around 9 p.m. That was the last time I saw her. Her apartment showed no signs of her returning that night. She had just vanished without a trace. The police eventually declared her a missing person, presuming she met with some kind of foul play or accident. So I tried my best to move on, but thoughts of Amy still haunted me. Anyway, I decided it was time to get back out there and agreed to meet this Hannah girl for dinner and a movie. I got the restaurant around time and told the hostess I was meeting someone. That's when I saw Hannah walking in. My heart stopped for a second. She looked so much like Amy it was scary. Same long brown hair, same petite frame, same cheekbones. I shook my head, telling myself to stop imagining things. This girl just resembled Amy. Lots of people have lookalikes out there. But as Hannah came over, the similarities just became eerier. Her voice even sounded exactly like Amy's, soft and a little raspy. I tried to act natural as we were seated at our table. Hannah smiled and made small talk about the weather and her job as a teacher. She seemed nice enough, but I was still weirded out by how much she reminded me of Amy physically. After we ordered, Hannah started asking me questions about my job and family. I gave her brief answers, not wanting to share too much personal info on a first date. But Hannah kept prodding for more details about my last relationship and why it ended. I zigzagged around the questions, saying it just didn't work out. In reality, I didn't want to spook this girl by mentioning my missing ex-girlfriend on our first meeting. But Hannah seemed very interested in my love life for someone I just met. She asked how long I had dated my last girlfriend, if we had lived together, little things like that. It made me uneasy, but I tried to keep up polite conversation. As the date went on, Hannah said, and other small things that reminded me so much of Amy. She twirled her hair the same way around her finger when she was thinking. She ordered the same favorite pasta dish Amy used to get whenever we ate Italian. She even had some of the same hand gestures and laughed at odd times, just like Amy did. This girl either had been close friends with Amy, or I was losing my mind over these similarities. I decided to test Hannah by asking her about places Amy and I used to frequent. I mentioned a few restaurants and parks that I knew Amy loved. To my surprise, Hannah knew details about the locations I brought up, like what color the walls were painted or the name of a waitress Amy befriended. She responded as if she had her own memories of going there, when these were places Amy and I discovered together years ago. My heart started racing. How could this girl possibly know so much about my past dates with Amy? We had never met before tonight. When Hannah went to the restroom, I quickly texted my buddy who set us up to ask where he met this girl. He said it was just some dating app, and she had just moved to town recently, so she didn't know anyone here. Hmm, that story didn't line up with how much Hannah seemed to know about me and Amy. Maybe she had seen my dating profile somewhere and researched me. That seemed very possible with how much personal info she knew. But digging that deep into a stranger's past seemed crazy. I resolved to be more cautious and keep my distance as the day continued. I was relieved but still uneasy when Hannah returned to the table. She smiled and suggested we skip the movie and go get ice cream at the place Amy and I used to frequent after dinner. I cautiously agreed but decided to fake an emergency call during dessert to cut the date short. Something seemed off about this girl and I didn't want to spend more time with this Amy lookalike and copycat. We walked to the ice cream shop down the street in awkward silence. I was deep in thought trying to figure out Hannah's motives. She ordered the same favorite ice cream flavor and toppings Amy always got, Rocky Road with rainbow sprinkles. As we sat eating, Hannah started asking me pointed questions about the night Amy disappeared. She wanted details about our argument and the exact timeline of the last time I saw Amy. I gave vague responses, getting increasingly uncomfortable. Hannah seemed very fixated on Amy's vanishing, which was raising my suspicions even more. Finally, my emergency call came and I said I had to leave suddenly. Hannah looked disappointed, but said she understood. She asked if we could get together again soon. I hesitated, not wanting to make any definite plans. I said maybe to be polite, then left quickly once we said goodbye outside the shop. I felt great relief once I was in my car driving away. The whole night it felt like being on a date with a ghost of Amy or her stalker. Just too strange for me to process right now.
It was a warm midsummer evening when I decided to treat myself to dinner at Gramercy, an upscale restaurant I had been wanting to try for some time. I arrived, embracing the refreshing air conditioning that embraced me as I stepped inside. The hostess, an elegant woman in her forties, greeted me with a polite smile and led me to a small two-person table tucked away in a cozy corner of the dining room. I settled into the plush seat, smoothing my napkin over my lap and taking in the sophisticated yet welcoming ambience around me. The lighting was dimmed to a romantic glow with tea candles flickering on each table. Soft jazz music played unobtrusively in the background, complementing the quiet chatter of the other patrons. After perusing the menu filled with tantalizing culinary delights, I decided on the pan-seared scallops for an appetizer followed by the herb-crusted salmon for my entree. I was looking forward to a relaxing evening of fine dining by myself when a man approached my table. Hi there, I'm Mike. Do you mind if I join you? He asked. Though surprised by the intrusion, his friendly tone and handsome features piqued my interest. I gestured to the empty chair across from me in acquiescence. We exchanged polite introductions over the bread basket, and Mike began asking me questions about myself and my interests. He was an attentive listener, nodding as I told him about my job in advertising and my hobbies like yoga and gardening. In turn, he shared that he worked in construction and enjoyed sports and fishing in his spare time. Our appetizers arrived and the conversation continued to flow smoothly. Mike had an easygoing charm about him and I found myself at ease in his company. I started to think this chance encounter could lead to something more. However, as we waited for our entrees, I noticed Mike order another cocktail, and then another. As he continued drinking, his mood slowly began to change. He became louder, more animated, often cutting me off mid-sentence. I tried redirecting the conversation to lighter topics, but an undercurrent of aggression was creeping into his voice. Just then the waiter arrived with our meals, but before I could take a bite, Mike suddenly slammed his fist down on the table, rattling the dishes loudly. What is taking so long tonight? He spat at the waiter. This service is ridiculous. I froze, shocked by its hostile outburst. The waiter stammered an apology and hurried away. I felt my stomach knot with anxiety. Mike was now glaring around the restaurant, as if looking for his next target. Trying to placate him, I said gently, Hey, it's no big deal. Let's just enjoy our meal. But he only seemed to grow more incensed, muttering under his breath about the incompetence surrounding him. I could feel myself shrinking in my seat as nearby diners began to take notice of Mike's tirade. My appetite was gone, replaced only by a mounting sense of unease. As Mike vigorously attacked his salmon, spearing it forcefully with his fork and eating with exaggerated bites, I knew I needed to leave. Mike, I'm not feeling well. I think I should go, I said evenly, gathering my purse. His hand shot out suddenly, grasping my wrist in a vice-like grip. Don't be ridiculous, the night is still young, he bellowed. I winced in pain as I tried to wrench myself free, but this hold only tightened. By now, we had the attention of the entire restaurant. A tense hush fell over the table surrounding us. I could feel tears stinging my eyes as I pleaded, please let go. I want to leave. His face was set in a dangerous glower, and for a heart-stopping moment I worried he might actually hit me. The next few seconds were a blur. I managed to pull away and leaped up, rushing for the exit. I heard Mike's chair scrape loudly against the floor as he jumped off to follow me. The sound sent a spike of adrenaline through my body, and I moved faster, heart pounding in my ears. I burst through the doors into the night, fumbling for my keys with shaking hands. I clicked a key fob frantically until I saw my car's lights flash. Just as I pulled open the door, Mike came stumbling out behind me, shouting incoherently. Terrified, I threw myself into the driver's seat, immediately hitting the lock button. Mike pounded on the window, screaming at me to come back inside as I hurriedly revved the engine to life. Peeling out of the parking lot, I left him unsteadily flailing his arms in the rear view mirror. I drove aimlessly for a few minutes, my whole body still trembling in the aftermath. Hot tears spilled down my cheeks as I tried to process what happened. I just couldn't believe the dramatic turn the evening had taken. What began as a pleasant encounter ended in chaos and fear. In the days following that traumatic night, I replayed everything over and over in my mind, riddled with self-doubt. I questioned if I had missed obvious red flags about Mike or if I had done something to provoke his volatility. But in the end, I knew his behavior was not my fault or responsibility. Still, the experience left me shaken and reluctant to trust again so easily. 
I became hypervigilant about avoiding risky situations and heeding any instincts that made me feel unsafe or uneasy. In time, the painful memories of that night faded, but the lessons never did. I emerged wiser and committed to protecting myself, a silver lining to an otherwise dark cloud. I have been chatting with Ben for a few weeks after we matched on a popular dating app. He seemed intelligent, charming, and we really hit it off right away. So when he finally asked me out on a real first date, I enthusiastically said yes. I took extra time getting ready that Friday night, carefully choosing my outfit and freshening out my makeup. I wanted to look nice but not overdressed for the casual cafe we had picked for our date spot. As I drove to meet Ben, I felt a blend of eager anticipation and nervousness swirling around in my stomach. I was optimistic that we would hit it off just as well in person as we had over our messaging conversations. When I arrived at the cafe, I immediately spotted Ben sitting at a table next to the front window. He looked just as cute as he did in his profile photos with wavy brown hair and warm chocolate eyes. He smiled broadly and stood up to greet me as I approached the table. We exchanged a slightly awkward hug before sitting down across from each other. The initial few minutes were filled with polite small talk as we settled in and ordered our coffees. The conversation soon flowed easily between us once the barista brought our drinks over. Ben told me he was an amateur photographer and talked passionately about his interest in capturing artistic shots of landscapes and city scenes. I mentioned I had always loved photography too and used to borrow my dad's old film camera while I was younger to take artsy photos. Ben's eyes lit up when I said this and he immediately started gushing about his own camera equipment and all the technical details that went into photography. As we chatted, Ben asked if he could take some pictures of me with his camera. He eagerly explained that he found me so photogenic and would love to practice his portrait photography skills. Although feeling a little shy at first, I agreed to let him take a few photos. I tried to act natural as Ben maneuvered around with his camera, clicking away to get me in just the right light. He took several close-up shots of my face, some of me laughing or mid-sip of my coffee, and even a few candid style shots of me looking away or out the window. I noticed he was very invested in capturing the perfect images, constantly adjusting his angles and zooming in close. As the date went on, Ben continued taking more and more photos of me, directing me to tilt my head certain ways or move a certain direction. I started feeling increasingly uncomfortable at being photographed so extensively, but I tried not to let it show. I didn't want to ruin the flow of our date or make Ben feel bad about his hobby, so I pushed down my reservations and let him continue with the impromptu photo shoot. When the date finally started wrapping up, Ben smiled and said he couldn't wait to go through all the shots on his computer later. He was sure they had turned out beautifully. I said goodbye a little awkwardly, feeling uncertain about the large number of photos he had snapped without really asking if I was fully comfortable with it. Over the next few days, I found myself replaying moments from the date in my head. Despite feeling a bit weird about the excessive photos, I had genuinely enjoyed spending time with Ben. We seemed to have a real connection, and I wondered if he would ask me on a second date soon. But this hopefulness came crashing down just a few days later when I made a shocking discovery online. As I was scrolling through social media during some downtime, I was horrified to stumble upon a post from Ben. He had uploaded several of the photos he took of me at the cafe and written long captions detailing our date activities. Even worse, he had used my full name and revealed other private information about me, like where I worked and went to school. My stomach dropped, and I immediately felt violated to see myself exposed online like this without my consent. How could he think this was okay? I felt angry, hurt, and betrayed. I quickly messaged Ben demanding he delete the post and all the photos of me right away, but he responded by dismissing my concerns, saying he didn't understand what the big deal was. He claimed he was just proudly sharing our wonderful date and some beautiful photographs with his friends and photography network. I tried insisting that he had no right to use my name and image without permission, but he just accused me of overreacting and being unreasonable. The more I tried to get through to him, the more irritated he became. He refused to remove the content and then angrily blocked me on social media. Over the following days and weeks, Ben proceeded to ramp up his invasive and harassing behavior. He started showing up unexpectedly at places he knew I would be, my gym, the coffee shop I went to every morning, even waiting outside my workplace. It was clear he was stalking me in person now, as well as continuing to monitor me online. I felt violated, frightened, and powerless. My calls and messages begging Ben to leave me alone went ignored. Once vibrant and social, 
I now found myself withdrawn from friends and constantly looking over my shoulder in public. I knew I had to take bolder action to stop Ben's frightening stalking campaign. So I filed reports about him with the police and social media companies. It was draining repeating my story over and over, but eventually the authorities took my complaints seriously. Ben was forced to delete the violating posts and cease his harassment both online and in person. I also pursued legal action to ensure he would face consequences for terrorizing me. The entire experience left me feeling exposed, untrusting, and anxious. But with help from counselors, friends, and family, I've been able to slowly work through the emotional trauma. I'm rebuilding my sense of security and personal boundaries. I was elated for my very first date with Katie. We originally met a few weekends prior at my friend Jason's backyard barbecue. I still remember first spotting her across the patio, laughing with a group of girls I didn't recognize. She had this gorgeous long brown hair that blew lightly in the summer breeze as she chatted. Even from a distance, I could tell her smile lit up her whole face. I got the courage to approach her, complimenting the colorful floral print dress she was wearing. That sparked a conversation which flowed easily between us for over an hour. By the end, I worked up the nerve to ask for her number. I was pleasantly surprised when she enthusiastically agreed. Over the following week, we texted back and forth, until I finally asked if she wanted to get dinner that upcoming Saturday. When she said yes, I was over the moon. I made reservations that day at a brand new modern restaurant downtown I had been wanting to try. The day of our date, I took extra time getting ready, making sure my outfit was perfectly put together and my hair was styled just right. I even splashed on a bit of the nice cologne my sister had gifted me for my birthday. Glancing in the mirror, I gave myself a little pep talk, feeling a mix of excitement and nerves for the night ahead. At exactly 7 p.m., I arrived outside Katie's second floor apartment. I texted her that I was there, and a moment later she emerged looking breathtaking. She wore an elegant floral print dress that floated around her knees, with her hair down in soft curls. I greeted her warmly as she approached, opening the passenger door for her. Katie thanked me with a radiant smile that eased my nerves. On the drive over, we chatted about our weeks. She had recently started a new position doing marketing for a nonprofit. I could tell she felt passionate about their mission to provide art programs for underprivileged youth. In turn, I told her about my job in software sales and how I enjoyed the problem-solving aspect. The conversation flowed smoothly, which reassured me we would have plenty to talk about over there. When we pulled up outside the restaurant, I rushed over to open Katie's door and help her out of the car. She looped her arm through mine as we walked inside. The modern decor was sleek and stylish, with tall vases of flowers adding vibrant pops of color. We were seated at a nice table beside the front window, with a view of the bustling downtown street outside. As Katie settled comfortably into her chair, I carefully scooted her up to the table before taking my own seat. We started perusing the menu and discussing all the delicious options. I was having trouble deciding between a few choices. Katie mentioned she had heard great things about the seared sound dish and reviews, so I decided to order the crab cakes. That way we could share and try both. After we ordered, Katie and I fell into easy conversation. She told me all about her recent girl's trip to Italy. Her eyes lit up describing the breathtaking ocean views along the Amalfi Coast and the quaint vineyards and pasta-making classes they took in Tuscany. I could tell it had been a very special vacation for her and her closest friends. In return, I told Katie about my goal to someday visit all the U.S. national parks. So far, I had made it to about ten. I regaled her with stories of backpacking through Yellowstone, watching powerful geysers erupt, and seeing the towering ancient redwoods on the west coast, humbled by their enormity and longevity. The time passed quickly as we exchanged stories, and before I knew it, the waiter arrived with our meals. However, the moment he set down the salmon dish in front of Katie, her eyes went wide, and she pushed it away abruptly. I noticed her cheeks were suddenly flushed, and she was breaking out in hives across her neckline. Her breathing became strained and ragged. Katie clawed at her throat. He asked me out that she couldn't breathe. In a panic, I called the waiter back over, asking if they had used nuts in the preparation of the fish, thinking Katie must be having a severe allergic reaction. His face drained of color as he stammered that yes, the salmon was topped with a cashew crust. I immediately helped Katie to her feet, keeping one arm firmly around her back as I urgently guided her toward the exit. We needed to get to the ER as soon as possible. In the car, Katie's breathing sounded worse, coming in short, desperate wheezes. I kept one hand clenched on the steering wheel as I raced towards the hospital, my other hand clutching Katie's in the console. 
At the emergency room entrance, I helped walk Katie inside, calling for immediate assistance. The ER staff quickly sat her in a wheelchair and started briskly wheeling her away. They called out orders to hook her up to oxygen and IV antihistamines, along with prepping an epinephrine injection. I started to follow, but a stern-looking nurse stopped me in my tracks. She stated only patients and medical staff were allowed in the acute treatment area. Instead, she led me firmly by the arm to the front desk intake station. I anxiously provided all Katie's information, full name, age, list of known medication allergies and reactions. As soon as we finished, I saw a doctor approaching. He updated me that Katie was now stable after receiving emergency medication, but would require monitoring overnight due to the episode's severity. When I urgently asked to see her, he said hospital policy only allowed immediate family in the ER. He suggested I go home and rest, returning to visit Katie in the morning after she was transferred to a regular room. The next morning, I stopped at a local florist and picked out a beautiful bouquet of sunflowers and daisies to brighten up Katie's room before heading to the hospital. When I got to the entrance, Jenny was already waiting outside. I barely had time to open my mouth to greet her before she started angrily berating me. She accused me of negligence for not asking about Katie's allergies, saying I had almost gotten her sister killed. I tried desperately to explain that everything had happened so fast. I reacted as quickly as I could to get Katie help. But Jenny continued to loudly curl blame at me for putting her sister in moral danger. Just then a doctor emerged asking for Katie's family. After reassuring Jenny that Katie was doing much better, he added pointedly that I had done exactly the right thing getting her prompt medical care. He said my fast reaction likely saved Katie's life given the severity of her reaction. Over the next hour, Katie continued to improve until the doctor cleared her to be discharged early that afternoon. Before leaving, Katie smiled at me gratefully and thanked me for rushing her to the ER so quickly. She said she was sorry for how Jenny had acted and knew I cared about her safety. I was feeling pretty nervous when I arrived at the cozy little cafe in downtown for my blind date that Saturday. My friend Jenny had set me up with her coworker Greg. She kept talking about what an amazing guy he was. Smart, funny, handsome, successful. I hadn't been on a first date in years, not since my last relationship ended badly. But Jenny convinced me I needed to get back out there. I trusted her judgment, so I agreed to the date. I got to the cafe early and fidgeted with the strap of my purse after being seated. I kept smoothing my sundress and tucking my hair behind my ears. I wanted to make a good first impression on Greg. After a few minutes that felt like hours, a tall man with tousled sandy brown hair walked in the door. He glanced around the room until he made eye contact with me. I shyly raised my hand and waved him over. Linda, he asked, flashing a friendly smile. I nodded, my voice suddenly failing me. He shook my hand before sitting down across from me. His hand was big, but his grip wasn't too tight. Up close, he was even more handsome than I expected, with laughter lines around his eyes and a strong jawline. The waitress came by for our order. I got a nice tea, needing something to soothe my nerves. Greg ordered a coffee and leaned back casually in his chair. We started with some small talk about the weather and our jobs. He was an accountant, which sounded dull, but he told some interesting stories about working with peculiar clients. He had an easygoing sense of humor that made me relax. Our drinks arrived and we fell into natural conversation. Greg asked thoughtful questions and seemed genuinely interested in learning all about me. I found myself opening up and telling him about my painting hobby, like crazy extended family and how much I loved my cat. He laughed at my jokes and shared engaging stories of his own. His smile lit up his green eyes in a way that made my stomach flutter. After about an hour, our cups were empty. Greg suggested a walk through the park down the street on this sunny Saturday. That sounded perfect to me to stretch our legs on such a warm day. We left the cozy ambience of the cafe for the wide open space of the neighborhood park. We strolled side by side, pointing out lovely flower beds and watching kids play. I snuck glances at his profile when he wasn't looking. Being outdoors brought out his ruggedness. I inhaled the fresh air, feeling more relaxed than I had in a long time. We sat down together on a wooden bench by a pond. Greg turned his body to face me directly. I'm having an amazing time with you, he said, his eyes tender. Before I could respond, he suddenly dropped down on one knee on the grass and pulled out a small box. I gasped, hands flying over my mouth when he opened it to reveal a huge diamond ring glittering in the sun. Linda, you're the woman of my dreams. Will you marry me? He asked fervently, gazing up at me hopefully. My mind went blank, my thoughts scattering. Marry him. 
I hardly knew him. We had just met for the first time today over coffee. I glanced around and saw people staring, which made my cheeks burn. Greg, I began gently, don't you think this is a little sudden? We only just met. I tried to let him down easy, but keep things realistic. A crease formed between his eyebrows. Son? No, I feel like my soul recognizes you. We're perfect together, he cried passionately. Now I was really blushing as the onlookers murmured. Can't we start with dating first before marriage? I suggested delicately. Today has been wonderful, but it's only our first date. I kept my tone warm but firm. His eager smile morphed into a scowl. He hastily shoved the ring box back into his pocket and jumped to his feet. I should have known better, he growled through clenched teeth. You let me on just like all the rest. Forget this. He turned and stormed off angrily, leaving me shaken on the bench. My heart pounded as I grabbed my purse and hurried home. Jenny called me repeatedly until I finally explained what happened with Greg. She was mortified. She swore he was totally normal at the office and not the type for dramatic proposals. His over-the-top reaction was disturbing. I wish our first date hadn't ended so badly. Up until the impromptu proposal, Greg seemed great, but his inappropriate outburst and temper showed me I'd dodged a bullet. I'll be cautious with first dates going forward, but one day I'll laugh about the man who proposed on our very first meeting. For now, I think group hangs are safer when getting to know someone new. No more surprises like that again. I could barely contain my excitement for my first date with Brian. We had met online a few weeks ago at a local hiking group and really hit it off right away. We shared a love of the outdoors and had the same quirky sense of humor. When he asked me how to dinner, I immediately said yes before he could even finish the question. The week leading up to our date dragged on forever. I changed my outfit at least ten times the day of our date before settling a flattering black dress and heels. I curled my long hair and did my makeup with extra care. I sprayed on my favorite perfume and was ready to go a full hour before Brian was set to pick me up. I tried to distract myself by tidying up my already clean apartment as I waited impatiently for him to arrive. Right on time, I heard a knock at the door. I opened it to find Brian standing there looking so handsome in a button-down shirt and nice pants. He greeted me with a broad smile and warmly told me I looked absolutely beautiful. I blushed and thanked him as we headed out the door. What an amazing start to the evening. On the drive to the restaurant, we chatted comfortably about our shared interests that we had discussed online, like our love of hiking, camping, and listening to live music. I was a bit nervous at first, since this was my first date in a while, but Brian's outgoing personality quickly put me at ease. When we arrived at the trendy farm-to-table restaurant I had been dying to try, Brian kindly opened my door for me and held out his hand to help me out of the car. What a gentleman. We were seated at an intimate table for two, lit by a classic candle-filled glass votive. The ambiance was perfect for a romantic first date. Brian suggested we order a bottle of red wine to complement our meal. I happily agreed as the waiter presented the expansive wine list. We decided on our rich Malbec that paired deliciously with our food. We clinked our glasses together in a warm toast and continued the effortless conversation. I was really enjoying spending time with Brian and getting to know him better in person. He had such a great sense of humor that kept me laughing all throughout dinner. After we finished eating, I was sad for our fabulous day to end. But the night was still young, so Brian asked if I felt like checking out some live music at a nearby bar. That sounded like fun to me, so off we went to listen to a local jazz quartet. At the bar, we ordered a round of drinks and found a tall table near the band where we could talk and listen to the upbeat music. Brian was very considerate all evening, frequently checking in to ask if I needed another drink or anything else. We had a great time dancing, singing along, and just soaking in the lively atmosphere together. As it got later, we decided to call it a night. When the bill came, Brian politely reached for it without hesitation. However, he suddenly looked panic-stricken, frantically searching his pockets and wallet, but coming off empty. I told him not to worry at all since he paid for drinks at our first stop. It was absolutely my turn to treat him. After I paid, Brian was clearly very embarrassed about the whole wallet situation. I tried to reassure him it was totally fine and these things happen, but he still felt awful. Since it was late and the drive was long, I suggested we go back to my place nearby so he didn't have to go all the way home. He agreed, apologizing profusely again for the mix-up. Back at my apartment, I'd brewed some fresh coffee and we chatted comfortably for another hour about our shared interests and traveling stories. I was really attracted to Brian's laid-back, go-with-the-flow vibe. 
all too soon, it was time for him to leave. He gave me a lingering hug at the door and asked if he could take me out again soon to make up for everything. I assured him I had a lovely time and would love to go out again. After Brian left, I changed into pajamas and got ready for bed, replaying the wonderful evening in my mind. Despite the hiccup with his wallet, I realized how much I truly liked him. I fell asleep smiling, thinking about the next time I'd get to see him again. I woke up the following morning to a text from Brian, yet again apologizing for the wallet situation. He went on to explain that he discovered it had actually been stolen at some point during our date last night. He didn't even realize it was missing until he got home and couldn't find it anywhere in his car or apartment. I felt absolutely terrible for Brian and told him not to give it another thought. I was just glad we still managed to have an amazing first date together, even with the theft. If anything, it brought us closer together since I got to see his responsible side really come out when he felt badly. I let him know I couldn't wait to see him again soon for date number two. While the night didn't go quite as either of us had envisioned, I think it ended up being a memorable and bonding experience for us as a couple. We had effortless chemistry and conversation, which is so much more important than anything else. The stolen wallet just made for a funny story we would laugh about down the road, certainly not a big deal in the grand scheme of things. First dates can be unpredictable, but ours went well despite the mix-up. I was excited to see where things went next with Brian after getting through this little adventure together. I still get chills when I remember my disastrous first date with Alex a few years back. He had seemed totally normal when we first met at the campus coffee shop. Just a friendly, laid-back guy chatting with me in line. When he asked me out, I happily accepted. Only later did I realize it was all a facade hiding his disturbing true nature. The date started out pleasantly enough. Alex picked me up right on time in a clean, respectable car. He had dressed up nicely two pressed slacks and a button-down shirt. We made comfortable small talk on the drive to an upscale Italian restaurant downtown. Over a delicious meal, we began getting to know each other. Alex maintained eye contact and seemed genuinely interested as I talked about my interior design major and dream of someday starting my own firm. He described his corporate accounting job and how he liked to unwind on weekends playing rec league basketball. So far, so good. Just a nice, normal guy sharing first date conversation. Nothing out of the ordinary. After dinner, Alex suggested we take a stroll through a park near the restaurant. It was a cool, clear evening and the park was peaceful. But as we ambled down the wooded trails, the conversation took an unsettling turn. Alex began confiding bizarre stories from his past, his eyes taking on a strange, fervent glow in the fading light. He vividly described being abducted by aliens as a child from his bedroom late at night. I laughed at first, thinking it was a joke, but Alex grimly recounted being paralyzed in bed by a glowing beam from the spaceship hovering outside his window. He talked about shadowy figures surrounding the cold metal table where he woke up in their ship, terrified and unable to move. Alex spared no disturbing detail as he recalled intrusive probes inserted all over his body to perform agonizing experiments. His grave expression and emphatic tone made it clear he fully believed every word. I walked along beside him, stunned and increasingly uncomfortable as the fantastic tale unfolded. Alex moved on to weirder stories like the summer camp conspiracy theory. He passionately described his certainty that the counselors were secretly poisoning the food and water to brainwash the kids for some nefarious purpose. I tried inserting lighthearted comments to nudge the conversation back towards sanity, but Alex was fixated on recounting his off-the-rails experiences. When I firmly suggested we talk about more pleasant topics, he became sullen and irritated. Then Alex launched into frenzied ranting about how politicians and celebrities were actually lizard aliens disguised in human skin suits. I tensed up as his volume rose, gesturing expansively as he outlined bizarre plots he swore must be true. It was clear Alex had lost all grip on reality. I was thoroughly unnerved and needed to get out of there. When I said we should call it a night, Alex grabbed my wrist roughly, saying he wasn't done telling me important truths. I tried jerking my arm free, but his grip just tightened and he moved closer. My heart pounded and I could smell his still breath as he loomed over me ranting. I was isolated in the dark woods with an unstable man swiftly becoming aggressive. Fear flooded my body. Taking a deep breath, I firmly ordered Alex again to release me. For a few endless seconds, I thought he might actually refuse as his fingers remained clenched painfully around my arm. But finally, he let go and I scrambled away from him as fast as I could. 
Alec's face distorted in anger, and he stepped toward me threateningly. Adrenaline coursing through my veins, I shoved past him and fled for the safety of my car. My hands trembled as I stood out of the park, checking the rearview mirror repeatedly to make sure Alex wasn't pursuing me. Only when I reached the brighter streets of downtown did my pounding heart begin to slow. I still couldn't believe the pleasant guy from the coffee shop had morphed into the ranting, paranoid stranger I had just escaped. It was the most frightening first date of my life. Once home, I immediately blocked Alex's number, though he made no attempt to contact me again. I considered filing a police report, but without solid evidence of a crime, I knew it would go nowhere. It was a sobering experience that destroyed my confidence in reading people. I became much warier when meeting men after that, avoiding isolated locations and watching closely for any red flags. In retrospect, I'm grateful the night didn't escalate into violence. Alex seemed volatile enough in his manic state that things could have ended very badly in those isolated woods. It was a wake-up call to always trust my instincts. If someone seems unstable, don't ignore those gut feelings just because you want to give them a chance. Years later, I'm in a wonderful relationship with a kind, stable man who knows all about my terrifying experience with Alex. My boyfriend is always mindful of my comfort level and would never dream of pushing any boundaries. I'm so thankful I escaped Alex to eventually find someone who makes me feel secure. But I'll never forget that night and how quickly Alex morphed from charming date to deranged stranger. Thanks for listening in. If you like these stories and want to hear more, then please subscribe and like and support this new channel. We have more stories for you to listen to.